Hi there, my name is Kevin Alcuni, and I'm a librarian here in the Exploration and Creativity Department with the Los Angeles Public Library. And I'm here to welcome you to today's LA Made, Witnesses for the Dead. Before we begin, we'd like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind the scenes staff for helping bring the LA Made programs to you virtually. LA Made focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you'd like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org slash events. And for our LA Made programs, visit lapl.org slash LA Made. Our website also has blog posts and video links that highlight the library's diverse resources and upcoming programs. We'd also like to take this opportunity to recognize and acknowledge the first people of this land, honor their elders past and present, as well as their descendants who are citizens of these nations. For more information on which territory you may reside on, check out native-land.ca. And now for today's program, Witnesses for the Dead. Join the Los Angeles Public Library for a virtual panel discussion featuring some of today's best mystery writers, including Gary Phillips, Aaron Philip Clark, Sarah M. Chen, Gar Anthony Haywood, Todd Goldberg, and Pamela Samuels Young. They'll be talking about Witnesses for the Dead, a new anthology that asks the question, how does witnessing a crime change a person? Inspired by recent true events, the all original stories of Witnesses for the Dead are set in motion by the act of witnessing. The characters who populate these pages are not themselves the perpetrators of the crimes they see, but as they grapple with what to do, take action or retreat into the shadows, their lives are indelibly changed. Those attending this virtual program will have an opportunity to win a free copy of Witnesses for the Dead here on, this, here on the screen. So email ecdepartment at lapl.org to be entered into the opportunity drawing. And now let's welcome to our LA Made stage, Gary, Gar, Aaron, Sarah, Todd, and Pamela. All right, look at these fine people. <laughs> Hi, y'all. Hey. Hello. Hello. All right, Hi. thanks for joining us. Hello. I'm going to hand it over to Gary, and uh, I'll see you guys at the 45-minute mark for any listener questions we might have. Well, actually, it's a, um, thank you, Kevin, but I'm going to hand this over to Gar, because I think Gar should start us off and uh, talk about the genesis of how this collection came together um, uh, based on a conversation uh, that he and his late father-in-law had. So, Gar? Yeah, my, uh, my late father-in-law, Lloyd uh, Creary, uh, was a really good good guy, very wonderful man. He was in his 80s when he passed away, maybe 15, 16 months ago, somewhere in that neighborhood. And uh, he was very much about community and family, very loving and uh, well-respected guy. And uh, he emailed me one day and said, uh, you know, this Darnella Frazier girl, uh, and she's, of course, the young woman who was videotaping or video recording. Uh, the the death of uh, of Mr. Floyd, um, he said we should do something for her. You know, she what she did was relatively heroic, and uh, you know there should be a way to kind of honor what she did. And um, I thought about it for a while, and uh, what I came up with was a, a general concept for the anthology that we're talking about, Witnesses for the Dead. It's a collection of short stories that basically deal with people like Miss Fraser. Uh, you know people that are uh, in all kinds of walks of life who encounter a serious crime of some sort, in most cases, uh, the death of someone, a murder. And uh, rather than just, uh, you know, file that experience away, uh, they take it upon themselves to do what they can to see that justice is uh, is done for the, the deceased in most cases. Um, so not being a... Uh, you know, not, not having 10,000 anthologies in my uh, my own uh, background or my own resume, I reached out to uh, the man himself, Gary Phillips, and ran the idea past him and said, what do you think about us co-editing this? And, uh, you know, Gary's been waiting to work with me for many, many years. And so of course, he, he jumped at the opportunity. And uh, I couldn't duck him, but yeah, that's right. Yes, that's it. He, uh, we pitched it to Soho and and uh, we made the sale. And I think the reason we made the sale, uh, at least most of uh, the answer to that question are here on the call. You know, we, yeah. we found some really excellent writers 
who wrote some really brilliant stories for us. And, uh, you know, we're very, very thankful for that. So um, that was the genesis of the, of the whole uh, concept. And that's, and Gary took it from there. You know, you, you give Gary a, a piece of red meat and he runs with it. So why don't you, uh, why don't you pick it up from there? Gary? Well, as you, as you, as you just said, Gar, the, the reason we made the sale is because we had these great writers to contribute stories. And I think that's a good segue. And I guess uh, since we're on the call and we should, um uh, on the call on the youtube that's what you kids call it youtube uh <laughs> I, I think we'll start in order or at least i'll start in order based on the the table of contents and we'll go through i'll ask each writer to talk a little bit about their story but not so much about the story but maybe about really about how they came up with the story i think that's i mean listen i think the stories are the stories and i think obviously uh people who are watching this or who or who will see this later should go out and buy and buy the book, but but I I think it's always interesting to hear about how an idea comes to you and how it kind of germinates, um, you know, as you set it on the page or even before you set it on the page. So I'm just going to go in order how it is here um, listed. So we'll start with uh, Aaron. Why don't you tell us what the title of your story and kind of how you how you came to it? Sure. So the title of my story is uh, Death at the Sundial Motel, and Excuse me. And the, I guess the genesis of it, I was living in San Diego about, about five years ago, and I was working for the uh, International Rescue Committee. And so what we were doing was resettling refugees. And um, oftentimes these were an incredibly vulnerable population. And there are instances where they were being exploited, especially um, there was a group of Somali girls who had been uh, have been exploited, um, sexual exploitation. And so uh, we have been working with the police. And so um, I think that was kind of in the back of my head when I started to think of this story, um, because I was thinking about uh, individuals who don't have much power, um, or I won't say completely powerless, but don't have much power just when we're talking about the structure of society. And so they were very dependent. Oftentimes there's a there's a language barrier involved or they're just kind of in the shadows of society a little bit. Um, and so I was trying to think of a character who could emerge from that um, and, and emerge from that when she had to. And so, you know, that's how I, I got the character Alma. And, and essentially once her son is taken from her, uh, she's she's put on this course um and and it kind of brings up a bit of her past uh, right. so she's she's no stranger to violence but uh she had set that aside with the hope of uh being being able to have a new life in the united states very good <clears throat> I'll, say, no, and I, I'll just say something and, and i'll get i'll get to, to sarah next but it is certainly it is certainly the case uh in alma's case that uh that uh, she she certainly has power she certainly or or at least she she is she can call upon it when she needs it. I, I guess that's the way to, I guess that's the way to say that, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, all right. So, so next up, I think, um, Sarah, why don't you tell us about, uh, you know, kind of the, uh, the origins of your story and kind of how you came to it. Sure. Um, so my story is called a family matter and I, I actually had a, an idea of a story um, I ended up writing something totally different. So something with anti-Asian, um, that was sort of my launching point, but I had no idea what yeah. I wanted to write. So I just did a lot of research and, um, came upon this, um, article about a bookseller who fled Hong Kong, um, during the protest in 2019. And he fled to Taipei. He, um, long story short, he he was afraid of there was the extradition bill was possibly something that could go into effect um, where China, you know, you could be extradited from Hong Kong to China, and right. he detained uh, in China for selling books um, that criticized the Chinese Communist Party. Um, so he 
he fled to Taipei and he opened a bookstore in Taipei. And then days before the, the bookstore was going to open, he was um, assaulted with or three men threw red paint on him. And they were ended up being arrested, but they were pro um like pro um pro china they were they were upset he was opening this bookstore mm. and what struck me was that he wasn't he was still going to open the bookstore but he was worried more about the investors who in, who invested in his book bar um and so i so then i just kind of was inspired by that and i created this character who was sort of He's, she's half Chinese. She goes to Taiwan. She feels like an outsider. So she's kind of, it's a story of sort of this outsider who doesn't feel, you know, like she's Chinese enough and she's um, sees something, sees a murder and she doesn't know what to do because she's, that's not even her country, her home. I said it in Taiwan. Um, there's also a father daughter relationship that I explored. Um, but yeah, that's not at all the story I intended to write, but that's what. Yeah what I ended up with. Well, I, well, I, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, you're right. I mean, I think both those things are at play. It's interesting, too. There's a whole familial thread that runs through a lot of the stories, but I, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll circle back on that. But still, yes. So certainly both of those things, as you said, are at play in your, in your story, uh, which actually now is a good segue then to your story, Pamela. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, uh, my story is, I, you know, I wanted, I wanted to write something that dealt with COVID. We were uh, <laughs> still in the, in the midst of that and um, thought about it for a long time. And I wanted it to be um, related to that. And I came up with the idea of somebody witnessing a murder that didn't know they were witnessing a murder. Um, and that gave me the opportunity to, to, to really for that for the my main character to put the pieces together and discover what happened after the fact so that mm. was the genesis of my story and was it were you inspired by anything um given your background as, as a as a lawyer were you inspired by anything you had ever run across before um not really but i wanted obviously my my uh oh Did Pamela freeze or did I freeze? The main character is a lawyer, so I think it might be me. So, but no, she's a lawyer and she uh, begins to put the pieces together because of her lawyer background. Right, right, okay. But but it, well, it certainly comes through in, in in the story. And again, it's another little check mark I want to get back to in terms of every sort of folks pulling from from real life experiences to to incorporate. Not even just in this story, but in, in stuff that you write in general. But we'll again, we'll circle back to that. So, uh, Mr. Haywood, I think you're up on deck next. Okay. Um, yeah, my story. Um, you know, I don't. In, in everything I write, I, I almost never deal with the police in any you know extensive way. But um, what I love to read almost more than anything else is a good police procedural. So, mm -hmm. you know, I love the writing of Michael Connolly. Etc. Um, so, you know, I thought I might dabble in that. Number one, and then number two, I wanted to look for a different way of dealing with um, the witness. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, without giving too much away, um, the witness in this case is not your typical uh, individual per se, right? right? There's a certain amount of technology involved that I think we're encountering more and more uh, every day. Uh, in our daily lives. And, um, you know, that's the unique spin, quote unquote, that I think I put on it. Um, but, I, it, you know, it's a day in the life of a police investigation that turns out to have a, uh, hopefully a very surprising and uh, satisfying twist at the end. Um, and I, and to be frank with you, I think I, I think I did a great job of dealing with these two cops, creating the, uh, the dynamic between their two personalities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I don't know that I could ever pull that off on a, um, at book length. You know, uh -huh. maybe someday I'll attempt it. But in the short story form, I think uh, that's that's the proper length for what I'm capable of pulling off well, uh, where you know, a police investigation is concerned. 
<laughs> is that wait? Is that only because then <clears throat> you didn't have to do that much research? What is that? I said, is <laughs> that only because no, no. you didn't have to research. do that much research what, in terms of you, police procedurals? What are you talking about? I I think as as a person of color, you know, getting getting beat down on a regular basis throughout my life by police law enforcement has given me all the research that I could ever want I to see. Gotcha. about how cops do their business. All right. Uh, you know, and, and with apologies to Aaron, who probably has a, a much different uh, attitude. Well. That, how's that for a segue to Aaron's uh, short story? <laughs> well, no, uh, I, 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 just, just to wrap that up on a serious note, you know, yeah, I think that's that's part of it. Uh, uh, Todd and I were talking off, off uh, camera a moment ago about how much research is really required to write. Uh, about things you don't know intuitively yeah. uh, and write well about it. Yes. And uh, I'm not ready for the amount of work it would take to write a really good police procedural at, at full length. Gotcha. Um, so in a short story form, sure, I'm I'm more than well equipped to do that. All right, there we go. All right, well, speaking of the law and beyond the law, Todd, what about your story? Uh, well, first and foremost, thanks uh, for doing this LA Public Library in Gar yeah. and Gary. What a what a cool event, and to be able to spend some time with all these amazing writers on the internet is it's like this is the best part of the internet is like you get to do cool <laughs> stuff without having to wear hard pants, right? <laughs> um, so the the genesis for my story actually comes from so the, the story that I wrote is called This Night in Question, and it really comes from living where I live. I live in in Palm Springs. And this city has always been a town that's filled with old gangsters, like retired gangsters who open up restaurants and bars and become philanthropists. Mm -hmm. And they change their local name to something else. Um, and so growing up, there are always these guys that were named Bobby, but my mom knew them as, you know, Tommy. Uh, <laughs> they were really Tommy D'Amico, not Bobby D'Amico. So right. all this stuff. So growing up here around these old gangsters, I, I got used to these guys that were really bad, you know, Chicago outfit, you know, hit men um, who now were, you know, supposedly nice guys who operated bars and stuff. Um, and so I wanted to write a story about one of these guys, one of these essentially somewhat retired mafia mm -hmm. guys who has something bad happen to someone in his family. Yeah. And he realizes that, um, he needs the help of law enforcement, um, but also that eventually he's going to take matters into his own hand. Um, and so I wanted to juxtapose um, those two things. And, you know, and these are things that have always interested me. You know, at, at what point do bad people call the cops? You know, when right. do they figure out when they need the help that, um, that the average person might have? And so I wanted to deal with those things, but I also wanted to deal with someone um, in the main character who was... Um, you know, not quite there. Someone who, yeah. it turns out, was about to have a heart attack. Um, so they weren't getting enough oxygen to their brain and they're seeing things and all that stuff. Um, and, and what it's like to be an unreliable narrator in your own life. Um, and so all that inside of a little, you know, 20 page short story um, was enough to, to get me to write a, a story that I hope is slightly different than. Um, than other kinds of stories about the similar stuff. I know from reading the, the book, I was like, oh, I don't know if I got the assignment right. <laughs> Hopefully I did. No, no, you did. You did. Uh, well, you know, it was, it was a broad, right? It was, we, we were, we were using, you know, using, as, as Gar said, we, we were using that as a, as a launching pad, but, you know, we certainly said that people should have fun with it. And, and I, I, you know, I, I'll just say this, you know, being co-editor, I mean, I really enjoy it the kinds of stories and the kinds of approach. I think that always makes, I mean, I guess if, if the point is that it's a prompt, right, to to come to the, to, you know, write the story, I think it's always entertaining, I think, to read those kinds of interpretations, right, mm -hmm. of, of whatever it is that the yeah. thematic, you know, thing is that holding it together. And I think it does hold together because it does, has these various interpretations, so it's not didactic and it's not just sort of one point of view kind of kind of stories. Yeah. 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 Um, so what about your story, Gary? It's your turn, right? It is my turn. So my story, Spiders uh, and Fly, I'm not quite, you know, it's one of those things where you, you start off with one idea, kind of like what Sarah said. I, 
I started out with one idea, and then somewhere in the middle of it, you know, it changed. But but I knew, <clears throat> and I guess I was somewhat driven by the image that, and I liked the image of of this guy at night trying to cross the freeway, right? Because that's kind of, it's ha it's during the day is hazardous, and during the night it's even more hazardous. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, well, you know, what would, you know, what would compel him to do that? You know, what's what's chasing him that that makes him want to risk his life like that? Because of course it says whatever's behind him is even worse. Mm -hmm. so once I kind of knew that idea, and then once I kind of knew, all right, I'm gonna make him kind of more, uh, you know, I guess the term is not, it's not a good term, Mild mannered, maybe I guess that's a good term. You know, more of a mild mannered, kind of ordinary Joe kind of guy, and he gets caught up right in this kind of extraordinary circumstance where he sees something, kind of like what a couple of folks have said. He sees something, and he's not quite sure what he sees, but he he does the he does the right thing, right? He makes the makes the call, you know, to report it, and but <laughs> well, not to give too much weight, but of course, it's in making the call that gets him in trouble, right? Uh, so I guess I'm not, I'm not trying to make a bid for being a bad citizen. I guess I should say that right off the top, right? You, sh you should report the thing, but, but, <laughs> but, in, but in his case, uh, the, the character's case in the story, it sets in motion, uh, what becomes a kind of, uh, once in a, once in a night kind of experience, uh, for him that certainly takes him out of his comfort zone. And I think as, I think as a lot of people talked about what makes these stories, Interesting is, uh, of course, in some cases, like in Todd's case and, and, and in Aaron's story, they're both characters who uh, have a kind of past that they thought they could leave behind, but of course, you know, you can't. Uh, and in other cases, they're just ordinary folks. They're just people, everyday people, but now they're called upon, <laughs> partly for just self-preservation, to uh, do something, you know, that they wouldn't normally do. And I think those are, I think those just make the, the best kind of stories, really. I mean, mm -hmm. listen, I'm all for action adventure stories, you know, where the hero is the ex Navy SEAL and all that hoorah. <laughs> 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 but we kind of know how those stories go, right? We kind of know, you know, but it's really putting the, it's really putting that, that ordinary person under pressure putting a right. squeeze on them, yeah. you know, and, and you're going to mess up, right? You're going to make mistakes. You're going to make, you're going to do things backwards. You're going to, you know, whatever you might fall apart. I think that was, a, that just makes it all the more, all the more fascinating. Yeah. I think I one of the reasons that. that we got stories as, as good as we did is because, you know, you're dealing with characters that are highly conflicted, right? Yes. I mean, we all struggle with the idea. I mean, this whole business about being a rat, you know, this goes back way back to you know the early days of of gangsterism. Um, right. You know, if you you go to the cops, or or even if you say anything, you know, yes. just if you if you go home to the wife and you tell her what you saw, yes. even that could be considered by a lot of people, you know, stepping outside of what you should do. Right. 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 Uh, if, if only to preserve yourself. Yes. So you know, I just like the idea that a lot of these characters in these stories came at that you know, that challenge uh, from different directions. Like, uh, we got very few stories, Gary, I think that where the the hero or the protagonist was just driven, you know, by goodwill and, and yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and good citizenship right. to do this <laughs> wonderful thing and expose what they've, what they've seen, right? right. Uh, yeah. Almost nobody came at it from that direction. And that's because, you know, it's way more interesting to do with the characters that we ended up with. Yes. Who, like I said, are having a hard time figuring out, do I, you know, do I do this thing? Do I take this step and that's actually, right. you know, publicize in some way? What or I'm they're driven by something, you know, deep down inside of them that, you know, that like I was thinking of Aaron's character, that this, the seemingly, um, the seemingly, you know, uh, non-threatening woman, because certainly the way he describes her, but of course she has this really incredible past, but it comes out, you know, and it comes out the way it should, which is to say it's just sort of revealed over, you know, a period of time over, you know, over the progress of the story. So exactly that, so that even the people that have a kind of background who have, you know, maybe have done dealt in violence in the past, but even then, even now they are reluctant. Even now they are, you know, they they they've turned a different corner, or at least they thought they turned a different corner. Right. 
but the idea that yes, invariably circumstances and just the uh, being propelled by their own, you know, just the stuff that's in their head, man, whether it's guilt or remorse or revenge, but the things that are keep pushing them forward. I think those are just, I just think those are wonderful. You know, those are great character traits that I think that we folks have explored, you know, in these various stories. Um, so having said that, uh, I'll put Sarah on the spot again. And um, so more less about, I guess, how you came to the story, Sarah, I guess the question then is, how do you, when you're writing a character like you've the, the protagonist in your story, any story, but let's talk about this one in particular, how is it that you get inside their skin? How do you get inside their head? Well, I, um, I have to write the story out to figure that out. Um, I, I didn't really know who she was until I started yeah. probably maybe halfway through the story. Then I'm it's like, Oh, this is who she is. Um, but she's not what I intended initially. I, mean, I knew I wanted to write about a woman who was in a foreign country and she feels like an outsider. She feels ignored, uh, kind of on the outskirts. Um, which I think is what drives her to find out what happened. She witnessed a murder and nobody's listening to her. Right. Um, so I just think of, you know, well, I, I think of myself when I go to Taiwan, um, I feel like an outsider. I don't speak Chinese or I understand a little of it. And people look at me and think, you know, you're obviously not Chinese. What are you? And, so I, I, I kind of, I guess, you know, incorporate how, how I feel. I mean, I do that with every character, little bits and pieces of that character. The protagonist are, are bits and pieces of me um, and people I know. So with her, I just, you know, I really channeled a lot of how I feel when I'm, you know, in a foreign country or I don't speak the language or, mm -hmm. um, and I, it also, uh, I, I, um, deal with the father-daughter relationship, um, which again is, I guess, me, uh, maybe it's sort of like therapy. Working <laughs> um, with my dad, because, um, you know, he lives in Taiwan and sort of also the politics of Taiwan, which is right. really, really common. I mean, I, you know, I can't sit in a short story, but um, so, I don't. I I don't know if that answers your question. Oh yeah, no, I, I, that starts to get at it. And and um, um, yeah, so it's it's a lot of like. Uh oh. Uh oh. Did, did I freeze? Did I freeze? You did momentarily. Just for a moment. <laughs> I think we lost the last part of your sentence there, uh, Sarah. <clears throat> Oh, okay. I don't know what I said. I think I said, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, then you said something after that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, right. I don't remember back. what I said. <laughs> um, it obviously wasn't very important. No, um, no, it was. It was. Um, and Aaron, you mentioned, you know, you talked about this real life experience of yours and how, you know, doing that work, obviously, and observing these folks help you to then uh, come to this character. And, I, you know, and I get, and I'm, but I'm always kind of just interested in how writers think about their characters, I guess. So, and did you know, um, let's say distinct from Sarah, did you know from the beginning who this woman was and you know what I mean? And who she was going to be? I mean, I guess I started with the emotion. So I started with, you know, the fact that she would be grieving. So once yes. her son is, is taken, and then I said to myself, if you were undocumented or you were a refugee and, you know, essentially you you were in the country and you were already being exploited because she's being exploited at her job. Uh, but you have this huge distrust of the police because of your experiences in your own in your home country. Right. And then also the fear of being, you know, deported. How do you how would that character even grieve her child? Yes. Right? So her child is taken from her in this violent way. And it's not like she could run to the police. So it's like, well, where where can she go? Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's really where I started. And then I kind of 
I think that that's where some of her background was born from. Cause it's mm-hmm. like, you know, if this was, you know, her home country, she knew, she knew exactly what to do. Right. Right. Um, and, and so we get a glimpse of that, how she handles the situation in the story, mm-hmm. but you know, she has to do it with this, with this mindset of, well, I still kind of have to tread lightly. Right. Yes. Um, until she gets to that point where, where she finds the girl who's being exploited and she realizes, oh, there's no going back. Right. Like, the, you know. Right. It, 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 right. I've already, I'm in, I'm in this far, so I'm, I'm, I'm in all the way. Yeah. It, it was too much of a trigger. So once that right. happens, you know, she understands, um, you know, essentially that who she was in her home country is who she's going to have to become again if she's going to uh, get justice. And not just justice for the girl who's being exploited, but justice for, for her son. Gotcha. So, Pamela, I have a slightly different take on my question for you, which is, in your story, it is it is very much, um, I mean, listen, all, all mysteries are a puzzle to some extent, but this, but yours is very much more of a, you know, a, it's a kind of more um, cerebral puzzle that the character figures out, right? I mean, I mean, it, it is partly about the situation she's in, but then it's also about really how how they how they step back and they sort of take it apart. And 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 was that intentional in terms of giving that character that ability? Uh oh. Who was trying to figure things out like she was at work? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but you're, you're kind of glitching. Uh-oh. Is it still? Oh, is it still? Yes, I think so. Okay. This damn technology. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'll try one more time, and if not, we can we can pause me. But um, okay. Now I forgot the question. Um, no, the, the the cerebral nature of the 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 puzzle nature of your story. And the and your character who figures this out. I mean, I guess I'm just saying, how intentional was it to make her that kind of thinker, that kind of person who, you know, this analytical person? Yeah, very, very intentional. I mean, again, this was somebody she loved. This was her twin brother, right? And she couldn't accept that this was happening to him. And you know, you know how in all things in life we have this this niggling um, idea of, that something isn't right, but you don't. But everything looks right but it doesn't seem like it's right. So it, I kind of wanted it, cause I went back and forth on what I was gonna write about and then had another idea, then the deadline's here, still don't have it. Then I called for a week extension. <laughs> 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 and so um, you, sometimes some of us all tend to write better under pressure. That's but it. I wanted, I wanted cause, I, cause I didn't want it to just be something you could say, oh, this is what happened. I kind of wanted it to be a slow reveal and I, I mean, I, tried to make it that way so right. uh, and to and because this was you know he was close to her heart but also the the person the culprit was close to her heart in right. some ways right so, you know, it's it's all right we got most of that now she just faded out again all right well, um, we'll, we'll, we'll come back and then she'll finish the rest of that rest of that that sentence um i'm gonna jump to todd i didn't and, know we asked for extensions Sorry. <laughs> no, Sarah, we don't. No, as editors, we try not to let you guys know that, you know, because then then everybody's going to ask for an extension. You know what I mean? It, 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 the stuff ain't getting in. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Yeah, we got, you know, as Pamela said, we want that pressure on you to produce that good work. You know, yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, so, Todd, back to Palm Springs for a minute, because I am interested in how you frame thinking about your story which is to say having hearing these old stories about the old palm springs and the gangsters and you know you know folks who move there to kind of reinvent themselves or you know kind of lay low or whatever so and i know you've written quite a few stories about that area so i mean are you just sort of constantly kind of mining you know what i mean the past as well as the present um for, for your stories you know, it it depends. You know, I, I certainly I certainly have my obsessions, right? <laughs> and um, and I know what I what I'm interested in. And sometimes I find myself writing stories 
that take place here um, because my obsession with certain things, like why we abide certain kinds of crime, yes. um, why we allow, um, you know, what I've talked about this before, but why there's a museum in Las Vegas to the mafia, but there's not a museum in LA to the Crips and Bloods, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, right. Like these are these larger existential questions about what we accept uh, for criminals and criminality yeah. in the United States. And, and so I'm fascinated by that. And a lot of it happens at a smaller level here in Palm Springs because it's a city that was built by criminals. Right. Um, just like Las Vegas was, Palm Springs was. It's the yeah. same boondoggle in, in Palm Springs as it is in Las Vegas, except that right. they legalized gambling there. Um, but I think what, what happens for me um, in exploring you know, these sorts of natures of organized crime is that I see the parallels pretty easily to how crime has infested all parts of American culture at some level. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I went to um, I went to Starbucks today. I'm going to show. I have a prop. I went to Starbucks today, right? And uh, I paid with my credit card, and uh, it immediately asked me if I wanted to tip twenty percent, and I was like, I don't really feel like I need to tip in this situation. <laughs> Uh, I feel like I feel like this. Like I, I, I mean, I could, but now yeah. the pressure is on me. I, like right. I'm getting getting shaken down <laughs> for twenty percent of my order right in front of me. Um, and so, like these are the things that go in my head. And I was happy to tip my twenty percent. But like the, these sorts of things that we think about, like the the extra costs, you know, the, right. the ticket master surcharges, um, you know, that people are talking about today for Taylor Swift. Like these are all just like bits of criminality that that we just take on as part of our everyday lives. But as it relates to witnessing crimes and in crimes in the Coachella Valley, I see weird shit here all the time. Because in the desert, weird shit happens. There's a there's a saying sort of locally, like, ah oh, man, it's just some desert shit. Where like, you know, you'll drive by and you'll see something happening and you'll be like, is that something I should call the cops? Because I see a clown having a fist fight on the corner. I'm like, nah, that's just some desert shit. Just keep driving. Um, and so all these things sort of filter into my head when I'm writing a story like this. And I, I think the the odd thing with this story as compared to some of my other ones is that it's not funny. Um, yeah. Typically, stories that I write uh, tend to have sort of a, a black comic um, thread through them. And this one doesn't have any of that. And um, I know that when I was writing the story, I was I was feeling kind of blue about the world. You know, everything seemed bad at the time um, and I wasn't feeling very funny. And I just wanted to write about what happens when bad people get faced with the worst parts of the world. You know, when when bad people have to look at the things that the rest of us see every single day and how do they react to that? Very good. Very good. All right. So Gar, my, my question to you is, is going to be different because you also had to wear um, your editor's hat in this uh, in, in putting together this collection, and so I guess the so so my my question then is, do you find it's kind of a I don't know not bifurcated, but how different is it reading and then commenting and editing somebody else's work, however you approach that, and and is it the same kind of um, do you feel that you apply the same kind of rigor to your own work? Well, of course. <laughs> I mean, we, we would lose everybody on this call, man, if I said something different. They, they know, they, wait, wait a minute, you didn't hold yourself to the same standard? You, you helped me forget? Well, who are you? Um, no. Um, I don't know how to answer that, Gary. No, sir, in serious, all seriousness, it's like, uh, you know, I think that as you, you never take your editor's hat off, okay? If right. you're the editor of the anthology, even as you're writing your own story, obviously you want the quality of your story to, you know, to, to meet uh, the standard that you're setting for everybody else, right? Yeah. So um, I think, you know, the reality is that, you know, and you'll, you can testify this because you're my co-editor. You and I, you know, went around and around about some things, some That's stories, right. etc. Right. Uh, we ran Aaron through the through an absolute ringer. I mean, I'm surprised <laughs> that he actually, I'm surprised that he actually showed up for this call. Uh, <laughs> but um, but no, the, I think that 
you know, whether you're editing or whether you're writing, you know, you're you're shooting for the stars. You're aiming right. as high as you possibly can can aim. And maybe there's more pressure on you as the writer, you know, to make sure that your story isn't the one that sucks in the, in your own anthology. You know, you don't <laughs> want to do that. Um, that is true. But I just think well, that Carl, you know, we wanted to uh, talk to you about that. Everybody, yeah. you know, let's, let's <laughs> do with that <laughs> offline. We can talk about that offline, Todd. Exactly. You know, we don't have to bring that up now. Um, but you know, the, the the beauty of being the the editor or co-editor of the anthology is it's like instant sale. You know, it's like uh, wh where's the pressure? I mean, what do you, what's Gary Phillips going to do to me? You know, uh, <laughs> absolutely nothing. So. Uh, you know, so yeah, there's there's no pressure where that's concerned. Um, I I think that, you know, the writers on this panel and the writer in the in the anthology, the writers in the anthology, uh, they all hold themselves to a very high standard in terms of yeah. what kind of work they produce. Yeah. And um, you know, as the editor, you don't want to, uh, you know, you don't want to do anything to uh, to disrespect that, right? You want to make sure your work does the same. So, I don't know. Do, I could tell that you know you were you were kind of like uh, mailing it in, Gary. But I I, I wasn't. You know. I, All right, thank I, you. I appreciate I, that. I, Thanks, buddy. Thanks, pal. Yeah. <laughs> no, the reality is I gave Gary a much harder time as an editor than I did anybody else here. So <laughs> I'm kind of surprised he's talking to me. <laughs> well, listen, but no, but this listen, this is the things that you know, and it's kind of, right, and there's always that kind of interesting process not having. You know, I've, I've edited, co-edited several anthologies, and, and I and I think about this a lot. Uh, and and some of y'all have done this too. I mean, you know, and 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 you know, Todd teaches in an MFA program, so it is trying to always think about. Well, you know, you, you you always want to be careful that you're not stepping on the way this the story that the person who's telling it wants to tell it. I, I try to think that I I help to facilitate however it is they want to tell the story. Now, there are certain things that you think, well, okay, now. There are just certain things, you know, that have to be clear or, or, or you have to make work on, on, on the page. But, you know, people have different styles. And, and, and I think and really, I believe it really does come across in these stories. Uh, and it's always right. So it's, it is a balance. You know, when, when do I get out of the way and when do I sort of impose or when do I at least push to ask a question? And then, you know, if the writer pushes back and, if, and the response is such that it makes sense, then, you know, you, you kind of go forward. And, and but sometimes you know, sometimes that can be a, um, a longer hit. But I mean, if, I think really in this case, I think in the end, yeah, I think all this stuff really, really came to fruition. And listen, and not for nothing, these stories also had to go through another edit once they once we turned them in, right? So there, yeah. I know in some, in some cases there was even some stuff that came back from the editors at Soho. But all that to say is that I think in the process of all that, stuff did not get um you know the lights the lights did not get dimmed i mean they got you know the, 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 it was sharpened and whatever whatever the metaphor is i'm looking for but i think it, it came across then in the in the in the polished uh uh finished product gary can, can i tell uh the world about advice you once gave me on an edit many years ago that i get <laughs> on a regular basis sure <laughs> So Gary was uh, editing Orange County Noir, and I was oh going to have a story in there, but then my book came out before it, and so I had to pull it. doesn't matter. Gary gave me the best advice I've ever received on writing short fiction and novels in general. I don't even know if you remember what you told me, Gary. But he called me up. We were talking on the phone about the short story, and he's like, all right, page five. You need to do something hardcore on page five. And I was like, something hardcore on page five. You're like, yeah. Some hardcore has to happen on page five. I was like, all right, okay. He's like, all right, moving forward, moving forward. Uh, page 11, page 11. Something badass has to happen on page 11. <laughs> and I was like, something, okay, so something hardcore on page five, something badass on page 11. And so we were like, yeah, man, like something badass has to happen. <laughs> okay. And then we got to about page 17, and Gary, you said, like, does he have a catchphrase or something? Like, can you throw in a catchphrase right here? And I was like, I don't really write catchphrases. And you're like, all right, well then, some hardcore again right here. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was like, so just so I'm clear, page five, something hardcore, page 11, something badass, and page five, something hardcore. And you were like, yeah, yeah, that'll do it. And I was like, all right, yeah, okay. 
And I swear to God, Gary, like I created an MFA program at UC Riverside with, with that theory in my mind. Like, you know there you go. Do something hardcore and do something badass. <laughs> if not, do something hardcore again. Do some hardcore again. That's it. Dude, it's the best advice I've ever received in my entire life as a crime writer. There you go. There we go. You realize, you realize that everybody's going to jump off of this call now and go through Todd's book and through Gary's stuff. That's right. Eight, five, eight, 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 seven, eight. We're going to be looking at all three of those pages and everything you guys have written. That's it. Sure enough, yeah. we're going to find something. <laughs> uh, the story is called Rainmaker. It's in my last book, The Low Desert. You can go uh, <laughs> that's it. All right. That's a perfect segue. Uh, back to you, Kevin. <laughs> cool. Uh, page five, badass. It, hardcore. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, all right. So we have a question here from a, from a viewer. Uh, when writing something based on or inspired by things that really happened, how much freedom to deviate from facts do you feel you have? Or conversely, do you feel like you must you must widely deviate? So I guess whoever just wants to chime in with mm -hmm. their thoughts about that. Don't do not do it all at once, though. It's one at a time. <laughs> well, I, I, I know I, I wrote my story mm -hmm. based on like a real um, situation that happened in Taiwan to the bookseller. So, but that was like an inspiration, kind of a launching point. Um, it wasn't, you know, like, um, like a, I don't know, a, an account of, yeah. uh, what happened exactly. So it was just more like, uh, inspiration to, for my story. Yeah. And I wonder if a lot of it is like you find, um, you look at the act or the event and then you try and figure out like what's the story behind it and build out from there yeah. kind of figuring out the interesting things because you're not you're not doing journalism you know you're you're trying to convey a story and convey a feeling or an emotion or you know uh, um, I, I'm, I'm thinking hopefully you're you're creating some sort of feeling within the reader and then yeah. leaving some sort of lasting impression and so you're working towards it. I mean I don't mean to put words in your guys' mouth but that's that's what I would Think of as some of the process. Well, I think too, well, like I'm you know, wondering, I'm wondering what... adjacent to truth, the mm. the emotional truth becomes more important than the actual truth, if that mm. makes sense. Sure, um, sure. And I think about, you know, I think about writers from like from Graham Greene to Michael Connolly, where they're writing about things that you know are of current interest, but they're putting their own spin on it. I think about this as it relates to. Um, the uh, the Quiet American by Graham Greene. Mm. Graham Greene predicted the entire outcome of the Vietnam War in the in the Quiet American, um, and he was writing about it contemporaneously. And he's writing about things you know that are adjacent to truth that end up being truth. And so I think as long as there's that emotional and empathetic bridge to reality, being being a, a strict moral adherent to the reality itself doesn't quite matter. And I'm sorry, I stepped on your toes there, Sarah. Oh no, you're, Sarah Pro. you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Gar, did you have something to add though? Well, I, know I, was, I was just gonna say I, I don't know, you know, I don't I don't know under what circumstances a writer feels obligated to deviate from mm -hmm. what he's witnessed or he or she has witnessed in, in order to write about it. Um, you know, I obviously I guess there are certain legal considerations in some cases, but for the most part, um I think we would all agree that no matter how crazy something is that we've actually witnessed that really did happen, mm -hmm. we're going to want to put our own spin on it anyway, uh, you know, and, and, and turn it to the left or turn it to the right. Um, you know, we're not reporters, we're writers. So yeah. the idea of just writing something exactly as it happened, uh, the dialogue exactly as it was said, uh, is, is not really what we're into. We're all here because we're into fiction and, and adding our voice to, you know what we what we see out in the world so yeah cool uh we had another uh, question from daniel here um can you talk about how the moral code for the world of your of your story develops meaning what crimes are punished which ones are allowed and which ones are rewarded hmm. uh, well, I, I'm, I'm gonna jump in because i purposely 
gave an ambiguous ending to my story, which I thought, once you know who the perpetrators are in the story, I thought was more realistic, uh, which I guess to some extent might be considered more uh, cynical. And and I I don't know that I'm being cynical, and I don't want to give I don't want to I want to make everybody go read all the, the book all the stories in the book. So I don't want to say who the perpetrators are, but I will say this much that the who the perpetrators are uh, that grouping exists that grouping still exists even though there's going to be a new um, a change in the leadership uh, in LA County but I thought that because it's such a deep-seated uh, entity a problem that I didn't I didn't want to give I did I also didn't want to be Pollyannish I guess that's what I'm really getting to I didn't want to be like oh everything gets exposed and you know like in the old days and everything gets get you know like Watergate everything gets in the paper and everything you know you know, it changes just like that. Well, of course, we know it doesn't, right? Things right. go on and whatever, whatever. And then, so I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be too downbeat, but then I also didn't want to be Pollyanna. So I thought it was important, at least for the context of the story I was telling you, that it ends how it ends. But you were being cynical. I mean, let, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. let's be clear about that. You're I guess really, that's my default. Yes. Cynical, right. so, that's you know, right. Nothing new about that. Right. Yeah. Um, does anybody else have anything to add? I think it's a great question. If any, because it seems like all of you have, you know, different worlds. And so, um, Pamela, do you have any thoughts on kind of um, how you create a moral code for a lot of your work? Um, I, I guess I start with my own moral code, and being a lawyer and writing primarily about lawyers, um, it's it's kind of it's kind of easy. And it's kind of easy to make the lawyer a, to make lawyers a bad guy when I want to do that. <laughs> I remember when I when I was a, a beginning writer and I was and writ, wrote, I'd written my first couple of books. I would look for stories by reading the Daily Journal or reading the um, there's a, a couple other legal newspapers and looking the section where they 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 run who's got disbarred and why they got disbarred. <laughs> and, and I could always find great characters great stories about facts that um that you that you wouldn't think that you wouldn't think about and i have a drawer full <laughs> of those still to be written so I mean, start with myself but i mean everybody people love to hate lawyers and there's um a reason for that there are a lot of <laughs> lawyers who are not great people i can say yeah. and it's and people don't understand that for me it's all about the money and I don't know. So um, again, I, for my, my moral code, I, I start with myself and then take it from there. For sure. For sure. Um, we don't have any more uh, viewer questions at the moment, but I guess I just wanted to ask a, a basic writing question, um, which is like, what, what things do you know now as a writer that you wish you knew when you were starting out? Hmm. Mm. <laughs> I see, that, that, that sound implies like a lot. <laughs> yeah, everything. <laughs> everything exactly. Holy, holy. How the numbers at Amazon are calculated. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's it. You know what, though? Can I, can I go back and answer that moral code question? Because it, sure, now sure. it's got me thinking about it. Um, yeah. You know, like no one ever writes a book where the main character in a crime novel is like, yeah, I solve crimes, but I'm also a, a pedophile and that's OK. Like <laughs> right. there's a very clear line. You can be a freelance killer and that's fine, but you cannot yeah. be a rapist or a pedophile oh. or any of those things. You can't kill animals like you can. You can kill a ferret, but you can't kill a dog like that's mm -hmm. not allowed. Um, and. Like, what is wrong with us as a society that any of these things are allowed? <laughs> like, that we that we have a scale of what is entertainment versus what is not entertainment. Um, and, you know, I, I think this this code of, of what is acceptable and, and what we write in crime hasn't really changed since the Continental Op went into that town and killed every single person there. Right. And we right. found it entertaining. You can yeah. murder as many people as you want. Just don't do anything else. Don't steal from them. As long as you kill them, it's fine. Don't don't take their car. <laughs> it's it's a fascinating thing. And 
you know, I think as crime writers, you know, there's there's a lot for us to answer for about how we decide what our own morals are. So it, it it's a it's a to to tell the the person asking Daniel, you sir mm-hmm. are moral. You shouldn't write crime fiction. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm going to close it out on this uh, pretty simple question. Uh, what's next for everyone? What are you guys working on now? Uh, I guess I'll go. Um, my work in progress right now is a, it's a novel inspired by uh, the talented Mr. Ripley that's uh, mm-hmm. set in the world of hip hop. So oh, cool. Oh. 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 That's, that's cool. Nice. Wow. Yeah. Speaking of moral ambiguity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Sarah, am, what about? Oh, go ahead, Pamela. Go ahead, Pamela. Oh no, I'm working on a, uh, a mystery that deals with the really deals with the mental health crisis and the homelessness issue in LA, and I'm trying to raise a lot of issues in that book. I also uh, just signed a deal with Simon Schuster, and for a book I co-wrote with Dwayne Alexander Smith, which will be out in early 2003. It's a a uh, mystery series involving two, um, a, a male and female detective. He wrote the male version. I wrote the, the uh, female, and it was kind of a cool process. He brought a chapter sent to me. Back and forth. So I'm really excited about that. Very young. Very right. nice. Great idea. Oh, nice. Yeah. Congratulations. Very yeah. good. Um, yeah, Sarah? I'm working on uh, revising a YA thriller. Um, it's my, my third revision, and I decided to start over from scratch. So, Ooh. oh wow! Um, yeah, it's about um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, intense female friendships, and um, there's like a love triangle and a dead boyfriend. All right, um, yeah. So, oh, yeah, for the teens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, um, Gar? For the teens, yeah, for the kids. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. For the kids. Yeah. Um, I, I'm writing, I'm in the middle of a book that's going to be, I hope, the first in a series that deals with, in a, in a comical manner, what would, ha- what would happen if you had a character that was, uh, uh, you know, professional troubleshooter who went around, you know, beating the hell out of people and getting beat the hell out of himself. Um, uh, how, how would you deal with that realistically? So in other words, this guy, what would your insurance rate be? Like, you know, how would you, you know, how would you, how would you manage to you know, yeah, get yeah. in your car, you know, without, with your back and your, and your arm, you know, in a, in a splint, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That, that kind of rock for the day, basically, yeah. right? Exactly. Great. Oh man, what good. about you? What about you, Todd? Uh, I am finishing up the last edits on my last book about a gangster rabbi. Um, so my oh. book, Gangsters Don't Die, which will conclude my saga of writing about rabbis, uh, which comes <laughs> out in uh, September of 2023. The edits, my last edits, are due December 1st. Oh, right so around the corner. This will be the last time you see me in public. Right well, also, send red breast. Send right. red breast immediately. Fare thee well. I love and, that title, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. All right, and we'll we'll finish on you, Gary. What's next for you? I I just recently turned in the the second book. Uh, you know, I wrote this book, One Shot Harry, mm-hmm. about this crime photographer set in '63 in L.A. And so now the so the sequel uh, starts right right in the middle of. Uh, uh, the Watts Uprising, 65, and of course, once again, Harry is getting his head beat in by the cops. Mm. <laughs> and uh, I laugh because, you know, I laugh in his pain. And uh, but, <laughs> but It sounds hardcore, Gary. Exactly. Page five, page five. Page five. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget page, page 11. Five. Page five. Um, <laughs> but, but once again, Harry manages to, to capture something on his, you know, on his, in film, uh, that then sets in motion uh, sort of the aftermath, and we, we sort of follow the aftermath of of Watts, and then you know as sort of the city now is in this kind of transition period. Wow, cool. that's great. Yeah. Well, well I just want to thank everybody for a great conversation. Um, this yeah, it was really insightful, and uh, I hope the viewers got a lot out of it. So thank you so much for spending uh, the hour with us. We really appreciate it. Thank, thanks for having us, uh, Kevin. For, 
with the LA made and the and yeah the yeah and please uh, yeah check out the book I know, so. uh, email us if you want a copy um, you can read all these great writers and uh, yeah thanks again everybody that's right <laughs> always be right. stubborn so. <laughs> right <laughs> thank you <laughs> all right thank you so much for joining us for today's LA made program. And remember to check out the library's online calendar at lapl.org slash events for upcoming library programs, including our next program, which will be on Friday, November 18th, tomorrow at 4 p.m. with writers Zahara Omar Shanzab and Baram Rahman. The library is proud to present young adult author Zahara Omar Shanzab and children's author Baram Rahman as they discuss their books, stories, and experiences of immigration. Those attending this virtual program will have an opportunity to win a free book. So until next time, we do truly appreciate all your support. The success of LA Made and literally all of our library programs could not happen without viewers like you. So thank you very much.